that out for yourselves. The golden lotus is connected from its beginnings with female honor. And since honor was one of the essential prerequisites for a respectable marriage, which was an arrangement between families, of course, and not the choice of individuals, Chinese women who expected to marry men of any social status needed to have their feet bound. Men came to long for small-footed women, and this painful practice was made bearable to the women as they endured it themselves and as they witnessed the pain of daughters, nieces, and granddaughters by an aesthetic conviction that their tiny feet were simply beautiful. This conviction is hard to share if you look at the pictures of the barefoot freed of its bindings that became a staple of the propaganda of later campaigners against the practice. But we have to remember that this was not what most people saw. For once it was bound, a woman's foot was almost always covered in elegant, colorful, embroidered shoes, usually embroidered by herself. It's a great art form, great Chinese art form, these uh, silk shoes. Jerry Mackey, who's a political scientist, has argued that we can see why a practice that aims to ensure that concubines or wives are faithful would spread down through a society at whose apex is an emperor with thousands of women reserved exclusively for his sexual use. Let's quote this passage. Um, I'm, I said he's a political scientist. Um, if humans want to have their own children, <laughs> it's a hypothesis in political science, uh, <laughs> Then an emperor will take costly measures to ensure that the several thousand women he supports are sexually reserved to him, while the interests of his wives and concubines will be to seek clandestine insemination from men more available than he. It is then in the emperor's interest to inflict costly methods of fidelity control. The next lower stratum, competing to provide wives and concubines to the apex, will imitate and exaggerate the fidelity control practice so as to gain economic, social, and reproductive access to the palace. The vacuum of women in the first lower stratum will be filled by women moving up from the second lower stratum, who in turn will adopt the fidelity control convention and so on all the way down. End of quote. And so, in the course of the Yuan dynasty under Mongol rule, foot binding did indeed spread southwards, at least among the elite. It increased in popularity among the upper classes of the Ming dynasty, as is evidenced in the great Ming novel, uh, Jin Ping Mei, which is known in English as the Golden Lotus, usually. When Shi Men, a prosperous merchant, goes looking for a new wife, the go-between who's arranging the marriage finds an opportunity to lift the lady's skirt slightly, displaying her exquisite feet, three inches long and no wider than a thumb, very pointed and with high insteps. They were clad in a pair of scarlet shoes embroidered in gold with a cloud design with white silk high heels. Shi Men observed them with great satisfaction. The Manchus, who overthrew the Ming dynasty in 1644 and established the last of the imperial dynasties, the Qing, took a dim view of foot binding, however, and they tried from time to time and with varying degrees of enthusiasm but no success to eradicate the golden lotus. Their first decrees abolishing foot binding were issued immediately after their arrival, but far from declining under their rule, it seems to have spread further among the Chinese population. Even some Manchu aristocrats ignored official prescription of the practice, and decrees against it were sometimes rescinded because they proved so ineffective. There are reports of foot binding in the 19th century among some of the minorities who lived in the empire, Jews, for example, in Hunan, or some Muslims outside Ganshu province. Most Mongols, Tibetans, Hakka, and Miao, however, abstained. By and large, the practice was less common among the poor, as you'd predict, given the function of it, especially in the south, in areas of intensive agriculture where women had a part to play in rice fields. But there are accounts that suggest that even beggars and water carriers sometimes had bound feet in urban Hunan, as well as in many rural areas in the north. Um, the, 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 it turns out that it's rather, the data about this is not terribly easy to interpret. Uh, a lot of the European travelers, and I have the easiest access to materials in English and French, um, probably mistook feet that were in shoes that were um, meant to make it look as though your feet were bound for bound feet, so there probably weren't as many bound feet as they thought there were. By the late 19th century then, Chinese women, especially those of the upper classes, had been binding the feet of their daughters for nearly a millennium, though the practice had also been banned off and on by imperial decree for more than two centuries. 
Women with natural feet, as they were called, were mocked. Women with small feet, especially those with the smallest golden lotuses, less than three inches long, were praised and prized, and their feet were the objects of erotic attention. Chinese novels and erotic manuals spoke of women who were aroused by fondling the unwrapped bound foot. They described sexual positions in which men could fondle the unwrapped feet of their lovers. There were tiny foot contests in which appreciative audiences were able to comment on and evaluate the diminutive size and proportion shapes of the golden lotuses. The women would sit there, pull their skirts up, and you could look at them. Foot binding was done to girls, some of them as young as three or four years old. It was intensely painful. It crushed the four smaller toes under the sole. This is the most extreme version of it. And compressed the rear of the ankle bone towards the sole too, forcing the bones of the foot into an arch much higher than anything that occurs naturally and creating a sort of cleft. Often, bound feet had to be cleansed of blood and pus. Occasionally, they putrefied and toes dropped off. Eventually, after months and years, the pain diminished, presumably because the sensory nerves were permanently damaged, but walking was usually difficult for women with bound feet. Missionary doctors in the late 19th century who were grinding, we should admit, a somewhat ethnocentric axe, reported cases where the binding caused ulceration, gangrene, loss of one or both feet, even, in the worst case, death. It is clear that the ideal length of the three-inch lutus was rarely achieved, especially outside the upper classes. Peasants and laborers often went, underwent a looser form of foot binding, which might also begin when the girl was older, and this process was both less hobbling and less painful. The husband of one elderly woman whose feet had been bound insisted in the 1930s in an interview that the less deformed five-inch feet of ordinary working women were no obstacle to walking or carrying heavy loads. Um, his wife was around and she didn't disagree, I mean, and she had bound feet. A three-inch foot, on the other hand, did not allow you to walk long distances. Women with the three-inch lotus were carried about in sedan chairs and often supported by servants even when they were walking. Most women with bound feet, however, did not need such assistance. Since the bindings were born both day and night, the, the bound foot had a distinctive odor, one that some found extremely unpleasant and others notoriously found sexually exciting. The pseudonymous 18th century foot binding enthusiast who called himself the Doctor of the Fragrant Lotus produced a monograph entitled A Golden Garden Miscellany, which consisted of unconnected observations about foot binding, among which was this gem, unbearable, painful corns, smelling the awful odor when the binding is suddenly removed. There's no doubt then that everyone understood not only that foot binding could limit movement and help keep women subject to their families and to men, but that it was extremely painful. Almost as soon as it began, there were literati who opposed it. A Song Dynasty writer is recorded as having said, children not yet four or five years old, innocent and without crime, are caused to suffer limitless pain. And the traditional proverb runs, one pair of tiny feet, but two cisterns of tears. Even those who favored the practice admitted it caused girls pain. Two of the Doctor of the Fragrant Lotus's other apothems were these. Slight displeasure, the mother who loves her daughters but still has to bind their feet. And can't bear to hear the cries of a young girl as her feet are bound for the first time. <laughs> 